You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, Gene. Johnson. Oh, Buzz Studios in Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menunos and Bing.com, and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies. This is AfterBuzz TV's R&B Divas LA After Show. We'll break down tonight's episode and get you all the latest news and gossip. And now, another post-game wrap-up show for your favorite TV show. It's AfterBuzz TV's R&B Divas LA After Show. The remix. <laughs> I remember this video. Hey, what's up, everybody? I am. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm in my end. There you, go. you want to go ahead? Oh, so called friends let her down. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I was the one. Mm. Yay! All right. <laughs> Welcome to After Buzz TV. Bingers for doing it. We are doing an exclusive with Kelly Price, the R&B diva, Grammy nominated, multi platinum, the multi platinum artist. I'm Bam Erickson. Please introduce yourself. I'm Megan Thomas. I am Alfred Nolan Thomas the second, and I am Larice Peoples. And again, it is such an honor that we have in the After Buzz building. She is a Grammy nominated. She's a multi platinum recording artist, and she is an R&B. <laughs> Diva, <laughs> welcome to the Afterbus Building, Thank Kelly you. Price. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Okay. Thank you very much. Since we're playing friend of mine, yes. Do you remember this? I do. I do. That was my introduction to the world. Nobody mm -hmm. knew what I looked like. Yes. I was just a symbol with of glasses. Mm -hmm. Interesting that the glasses are there because they're very <laughs> significant to me. Mm -hmm. um, with my initials, yeah. glasses and my initials. I remember. I remember hearing the song on the radio, and as you can see, I still got the little. The, the, it was a dollar ninety nine for the single, mm -hmm. um, and I do remember. Yes. I do remember that the picture was not there. Yes. And that obviously had to do with the fact of your weight. Yes, but we flipped it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people thought we did it because we were afraid of what people would think. And mm -hmm. we'd heard so much. I'm saying we, my team at the time, along who was Hiram Hicks and um, Ronald Isley, along with management, my husband, we'd heard so much that people were not going to buy a fat girl. We decided to take it and flip it mm -hmm. and say it really is going to be about the voice. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we serviced the music. Music, and I didn't do any television. I did interviews, but they were most of them over the phone, and it wasn't because we were afraid of what was going to happen. We wanted to show people what would happen if people heard the music, that they would fall in love with a great song, they would fall in love with a great voice. And prior to anybody even knowing what I look like, we had a number one song on Billboard. And I was getting ready to say because with um, with both the friend of mine and the friend of mine remix, yes. it went number one on the U.S. and R&B charts, and it made history by doing so by ha by being the only song at that time mm -hmm. to go number one without without the music. a video. Yeah, yeah. And then we released the video when people saw how big I was. Mm -hmm. I was about 275 pounds at the time, and we went back to number one after they saw mm -hmm. what I looked like. So yeah. So did they tell? Um, <clears throat> You know, going into the music business to go into your solo career, were you told by music execs in AR that, you know, you couldn't be successful, you couldn't have a number one hit because of your oh, size yes. at that time? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I was specifically told you can stay in the background, you can continue to write songs for people, and if you want to be an artist, the only shot you have at being an artist is to either do house music or mm -hmm. gospel music. That's what I was told. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Well, you proved them wrong, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Yes. I was the mule. We're going to yes. go into your music career later, but let's go into R&B Divas. Yes. All right, so tell us how you and R&B Divas came about for L.A. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, it started for me really more than three years ago. Um, Nikki Gilbert conceptualized the show, put it down on paper, and when she wrote the original synopsis, my name was in it. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been knowing about this for several years. Um, I was asked to be a part of the Atlanta cast, like for real, for that's just, you know, a lot of people say that, but I actually was a part of the original synopsis mm -hmm. for the show, and I'd been talking to her years ago about doing it. Um, but having seen reality TV done really well and reality TV gone really bad, I wasn't 
sure that mm -hmm. I wanted to do it, and I was intrigued by it, but I did say, I, my conversation with Nikki and then Faith, and then after Faith with Phil Thornton was, give me an opportunity to kind of look and see what you guys are gonna do with this show, and if you're okay with it, mm -hmm. you know, after the first season. You know, I can give you a definitive answer on whether or not I want to be involved with the show. And at that point, they were ready to talk about another city, mm -hmm. um, which was L.A. And because I live here, that was even more perfect. So let me be nosy. You said your name was your name was on the original list. Who are yes. some of the other names that was on the um, list? I know that Selena was actually a part of that original grouping. I believe Lily Lyons was on there. Mm -hmm. um, Angie Stone. Lily Lyons from from SWV. SWV. Uh -huh. Angie Stone. There were a few others, but there was literally an original synopsis that was written up in the original pitch that was going out. I was in that. I'd met with Nikki years ago about mm -hmm. this. Actually, even prior to some of the other producers coming on board, mm -hmm. um, she and I met about this in Atlanta. To years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's something that's been on my radar for quite a while. And I was very excited after seeing the first season. I was probably the biggest artist fan of mm -hmm. the show. I was every week tweeting about the show and just so proud. I felt like it was a great opportunity and a vehicle in, in the industry that has changed so much. You have to have other things happening with your music. doesn't matter how great the music is. You need another outlet in order to promote it and to push it. And so I thought it was great that in this concept, it wasn't just about Nikki trying to find a way to push herself, mm -hmm. but involving other people so that we all, who do the same thing musically, would have another way to, again, present ourselves to the world. So I was very proud of it, um, very proud of seeing two black women come together and become producers on television, mm -hmm. unheard of, mm -hmm. um, you know. What did you think about season two? Because it took a <clears throat> completely turn. Well, season two, I think we all can kind of say, wow, mm -hmm. you know, really. Um, it, my situation was already in place by the time uh, we all started watching season two. So okay. mm -hmm. um, my decision was strictly made on what I saw in season That's one. And I, I, I don't think that anybody could have thought that season two would have gone as far left as it did. Um, but I really, really have love for all of the ladies in Atlanta. They're all incredibly talented. Every one of them I know, you know, 21 years in the business, it's not that you come across everybody at some point. And I just, I, I want it to be about the music mm -hmm. because they all have incredible <laughs> presentations of their creativity that I think are going completely unnoticed mm -hmm. because of all of the other stuff. Um, if you had known, if you if they, if you guys hadn't started taping for LA before you had seen season two of Atlanta, would you have still done RB Divas LA? No, okay. no, no. Because my what I do understand, and that's no slight to my relationship with Nikki or Faith, or even my relationship with Phil Thornton. I have relationships with all three of them because they're all producers. But there are several other producers on this show as well. I've made comments about not getting along with the producers, but there are a lot of producers on this show. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, knowing that there are different assignments to different producers and some are more involved in certain aspects than others, um, mm -hmm. I would have had an opportunity to see that even though I did meet with other producers other than Nikki and Faith and Phil, because I met with all of the producers, mm -hmm. and they all told me that the show would not be this kind of show, they, I was specifically told we want to try to steer it back in the direction that it's supposed to be in because it's getting away from us and we don't want it to be that. Um, I would have known at that point that that conversation meant nothing and I would have known better than to sign on. Mm -hmm. But, but do I'm, you think that because of the raising, ratings of the R&B Divas Atlanta season two, where all the drama kind of sparked the drama with the uh, um, R&B Divas LA? Um, no, that was an intentional. That was an intentional decision. There was a meeting that took place at around week four of filming, and contrary to what's been said, um, I was not responsible for shutting down production. We met with all of the producers, all of them. Um, when you say when you say we did, all six of you girls were on the same meeting at the same time, or was it was it a meeting with Kelly and the producers, a meeting with Little Mo? Like was every it? artist was called in with her manager. Okay. One of the ladies didn't make it that day. Um, because she wasn't feeling well, but all of us were called in. Her manager was there, so there was rep representation for every lady in the room, mm -hmm. and five of us, out of six of us, in the room. That particular day, we were shown the trailer of season two. Now, we're in week four of filming. We were shown the trailer of season two for Atlanta, and we were told, this is what we want, and if we can't get it, we're gonna shut this whole thing down, because your show is a snooze fest, and I'm quoting them. All right, well, wow. mm. wow. so, <coughs> what was the reaction when 
you guys were given this information in the meeting? Um, everybody was very concerned. A lot of questions came up. A lot of the ladies started saying, that's not what we were told in our meeting. Everybody said it. Mm -hmm. This is not what you told us when you asked us to do the show. You know, you know, we're just getting into it. That's not fair. You're saying, you know, they're saying that the network wasn't satisfied with the stuff that they were seeing and that they literally were going to shut it down because at this point they felt like they were going to lose money. Um, and it was a great concern to a lot of the ladies. You know, two of them had relocated from the East Coast. There was concern that they'd come all the way across the country with their children and this is crazy. We've made plans around it. And so it was a concern. We all spoke with each other outside of that meeting with each other to try to figure how to keep the show going without finding ourselves like this with each other. I'm so glad that you asked that because yeah. one of my the, one of my biggest questions was when all this was going on and and he you know this person said this this person said that was I wonder was there any conversation outside of the cameras oh where God, you yes. where you kind of had conversations about okay this is what happened or I'm gonna turn up at this at this moment like it, it just seemed so S something was missing from the, from the puzzle yes. and, I just, and I couldn't figure that out. A lot, uh, there was a lot missing from the puzzle. We did have conversations with each other because everybody was concerned about um, having the wrong look among us mm -hmm. on camera. And those are the conversations that we had with each other. We actually mm -hmm. sat and made agreements with each other that if they're saying that they need more drama, let's figure out the kind of drama that we want to give them mm -hmm. so that we remain in control of it and this train doesn't go off the track. Those were our conversations with each other. So then what were some of the agreements amongst yourselves that you said, okay, this is what we can do to kind of give them what they want without completely, um, you know, going overboard? Well, I can tell you that in my conversation with Dawn, they really wanted her to dog out the, the other ladies from In Vogue, which she didn't want to do. She mm -hmm. just wanted to be able to tell her story. Um, and it's a very emotional thing for her. Mm -hmm. So the agreement that we had with each other was that let's talk about it. Go there if you need to. And if I see that you're going too far and you're can't, you know, I'll reel you back. Mm -hmm. We'll have a keyword, or I'll just kind of <laughs> cue you in and tell you, let me reel you back so you don't end up just going completely snap crackle on camera. Um, as far as Michelle A and I are concerned, there were some things that they wanted to talk to her about that she absolutely did not want to discuss on camera because she has situations with children and their fathers and that kind of thing. Right. And, you know, we try to, in our personal conversations with each other, create a safe place. We had safety words. Literally, there were words that we would say when we were filming if somebody forgot that their mic was on and we started talking about stuff that we didn't want them to. Our, our safe phrase with each other was, do you want a piece of chewing gum? Mm. And that's how we would let each other know you're forgetting that you're mic'd and you're saying something and you don't, you know. Right. We had, so we did. We made those establishments with each other. Let me, ask, let me ask this question because you mentioned Don and Don, they wanted Don to obviously talk about In Vogue. Yes. Um, she also talked about her ex-husband who was never named but mm -hmm. um, it came back to us mm -hmm. Dre Allen mm -hmm. um, who you may know he was a singer he was an R&B singer in the 90s did you know her husband Dre Allen and are you aware of what Don was saying on camera and his response to it because it's rumored that I mean control mm -hmm. it's rumored that he after he after Don said that you know he um, there was children out of wedlock and that he was abusive he retaliated and he was suing TV one and then therefore Don was fired and then that's why she didn't show up to the reunion so I just wanted oh. to get your perspective if you knew um, what was going on was she told from TV one that she needed to tell this story as far as you they know. wanted her to talk about everything that would be something controversial or that would present drama mm -hmm. anything that would be a good juicy bite okay they encouraged it um, she always wanted to do whatever she was going to do in a respectful way but she did want her story to be told I don't know anything about her husband threatening to sue the network at all I never heard that okay. actually I recently stumbled across that information uh -huh. um, in a blog okay. literally just within the last few days I'd never heard about that Dawn was not fired from the show okay um, her not coming to the reunion it had something to do with something completely different she was very displeased with the way the direction of the show went mm -hmm. and in her discussions with uh, both people from the network and the production company after the fact they couldn't seem to come to a resolve or even an understanding of how things got where they were they just couldn't see eye to eye so okay. um, I definitely didn't know anything about a lawsuit with her ex okay, okay. Um, uh, I'm good yeah well I mean for me when it came to that meeting where they have 
producers came to you and the rest of the women and were like, we want, we need this to be more interesting. How did it unfold to where, I mean, for me, and I think a lot of the viewers, it seemed like you all of a sudden were in the start of everything. And it was like around, I even called it like around week four, where all of a sudden this whole new caricature came out. Yeah. Where you became like, you were the best friend, the leader, the the one who was kind of hovering all the, the good vibes. And then it became a situation where you became this big antagonist. And yes. it seemed like uh, there was extra going on you could tell that probably put you into the position of having you know that stance in a lot of the situations yes. the fred situation or mm -hmm. or or even when you and little mo got into it i think that relationship kind of took the biggest toll out of whatever was going on i agree when it became i mean they weren't ignorant to the fact how did that end up spinning you into being an antagonist in this kind well, of situation. If I may be 100 yeah. percent, uh, that's what truthful. we want. Yes, be 110. This um, is after buzz. Because yes. fit it, one fit it. Because outside of our conversations, begin other conversations that I was not a part of, mm. and I actually started walking into situations that I had no idea mm. of what was going on, mm. and that's that's literally the truth. Was it because of the producers or just kind of the divas themselves the started having conversation outside of? There was a lot of fear on our set. People were afraid for their jobs. And there were conversations that were taking place between production um, and members of our cast. And they were literally being told, if you want this show to happen, well, my, nobody's, okay. gonna, nobody's gonna admit that. <laughs> right. But the truth, you know, so what you see, my, my, my disgust with a lot of it is because even stumbling into what was happening and realizing that this was going on, I fought for Kelly, but I fought for every girl on that set, okay. whether they ever say it or not. I didn't just fight for me because I, I feel like every woman on this show deserved the respect. People can say what they want to say. I don't care if it's been 20 years since they had a record. You called them for a reason. You put them on this show for a reason, and they're the reason why every person walking around here, a part of this crew, has a job. You know, I sat in a, in a scene with Dawn one day, and one of the producers was like, yeah, and I didn't have any idea who either one of you, you guys were when I came and took this job. Why would you say that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. peep stuff like that. Um, I, I made mention, and somebody tried to say it wasn't true. It is true. I had one of the producers curse at me. He told me to go F myself. You're standing in my house. Are you serious? Are you talking to me like that? He was told he wasn't allowed to come back in my house. My husband slash manager told the production company he will not come back in my house, and he's lucky he didn't get thrown out on his, literally, yeah. right. talking to me that way. So then my, my question is this. Did the producers... And some did they kind of once they once they uh, informed you uh, ladies that this show was born. It's a snooze fest. You need to turn up. Did the producers then have this attitude where they were being uh, being rude and disruptive to you, or had they always been that way? Well, there had been actually that kind of thing happening with all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once there was um, a division and a clear indication that there was a willingness to go along with other things mm -hmm. um, that were being asked, it was easier It was easier for them to do mm -hmm. because I'm still fighting what I think is for all of us, mm -hmm. and it turns out that I'm at this point really just fighting for myself. And I think the disappointing thing is because I, I don't take a stance of judgment with any of the ladies. I told every lady on the show, you took this show, you have something in mind, whatever your goal is, to accomplish or whatever it is you're trying to achieve by the end of this season, you definitely want to do that. And if doing something wild and crazy is what you're okay with to get what you're trying to get out of being on this show, go for it. I ask two things. Please don't ambush me. Let me know. I'll go along with you to do whatever it is that you're trying to do to help you accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, but don't set me up, and I won't do that to you. You know, when I was asked about bringing Kenny Lattimore, who is my very good friend, um, I was asked a lot to bring him into situations where Shantae was going to be there and not tell her. I went to her and I told her. Mm -hmm. I called him and I told him, you know, they're asking me to bring you on the show. I wouldn't do that. Um, and she said to me, I don't care what they say to you, Kelly, please don't do that to me. My response to her is, I would never do that. I'm not for that. I would never do that to you. Do you think in any way Wendy Williams was out of turn for the comments in regards to Kenny being homosexual? 
I think that on the reunion show is what I'm speaking in regards yeah, to. Yeah, um, I, I believe that we know that Wendy asked the questions that everybody wants to hear, I guess. Um, and she's always been known for asking questions that push the envelope. Um, I was... But after she asked Shantae and Shantae said no, mm -hmm. then she went to you and said, had you ever, like, some people feel after Shantae said no, my husband is not, that's something that you would need to ask him. Then it was almost as if she didn't believe Shantae, so she's going to go directly and she pointed at you and, she, and then she asked you the question. So many felt that that was inappropriate. Well, I've actually heard a lot of that, but in Wendy's defense, what I will say this, and I have no reason to defend anybody, there was a lot of extra noise and catcalling and things that happened that got edited out of that segment Okay. Mm -hmm. among people on the stage. So... Would you like to share? To say no and then to start giving two snaps up in a circle and slapping hands with other ladies on the stage and, and making little eerie noises and that kind of thing, you, would, you didn't see that. Uh -huh. You know, we, we taped for over four hours. So obviously, if it's a two-part <laughs> show, there's a lot that you didn't see. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like she redirected the question because she got an answer, but then she got delayed responses behind the answer. Mm. And so she asked the question again. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 I, I'm a super big fan of yours, Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> but I will say this: during the taping, every week I would say, "This week, Kelly is not a friend of my head." Yes. And then when I noticed it, it kept happening. I was like, "Hold on, wait. We don't went this whole season, and Kelly's not a friend of my head." Yeah. So That's horrible. Would you, say, <laughs> would you say that that is a, a, a real? Do you think the show is a real depiction of who you were, or do you think that you turned up because you knew that if you didn't, the show would get shut down? I was okay with walking away from the show. I told everybody that okay. um, what what you saw was a real depiction of me being put in a combative situation but that was never with the ladies mm. and yells I'm the screams all of that I was never talking to the ladies okay so what ex okay what question then I have about you and little Mo being at the Bugatta and yes. as soon as she asked you a question you immediately called for your husband yes was that because of production or was that because of her that was because of production. When I was being walked into the restaurant, they told me Dawn was waiting for me so she and I could talk about a fight that she and Lil Mo had oh. over the weekend. And when I walked in, Mo was sitting there. Live. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, yes. Kelly's husband manager is here. <laughs> yes. And uh, we would like to speak with him. Mm -hmm. So, you guys, please welcome to After Buzz TV, R&B yes. Divas LA. We have Mr. Jeffrey Roll in the building. Jeffrey yeah. yeah. Roll. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, congratulations over 22 years of marriage. 21. Yeah, oh, 21. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 21. Thank I know you, you guys celebrated just recently, so, yes. you know, thank you to that. Um, so, when when you were called into that situation, like, 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 uh, like Kelly said, mm -hmm. We weren't aware that that's what that's what happened. So when we saw the whole thing with with uh, with her saying Jeffrey Roll, Jeffrey Roll, um, what were you thinking um, at that moment when your wife was calling your name? Well, I, I, I've been married 21 years, so I know that call. Mm -hmm. And the problem I had is it was already hostile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that whole couple of hours was already hostile. What mm -hmm. was going on? That probably was the third call that Kelly had. You guys move over just yeah, to your right, just a little bit. bit. Gotcha. We won't see you. Okay. Oh. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Right gotcha. There. All right, <laughs> hey. So, so that was the third. I was already kind of standing in the back, kind of waiting, because was, that was kind of the third call. And the frustration was is there were so many little things that were going on. By the time we sh that scene, I say we because I'm a part of it uh, with her, but by the time she shot that scene, everybody was on 10. Mm -hmm. There was a situation with Mo and Kelly where there was an uncomfort, and Kelly's whole thing was, "I'm not gonna address you because you're my friend on the in front of these cameras." Right. So they set her up to kind of said, "Well, Dawn's in there, and you're gonna do it because I don't know. Obviously, there's a lot that's cut out." Mm -hmm. I stopped everything and said, "Well, wait a minute. Well, she's not gonna address her here with this. You know, if you want to talk about something else, Kelly will talk about it. If you want to deal with something else, Kelly will talk about it. If you want to, but it." At that point, you know, she had producers that were in her face, and that's something that's a no-no because that's something we had been dealing with for the last eight weeks. Mm -hmm. So I kind of was in, on standby, but I know that call. Kelly doesn't need me to talk 
or do anything, especially with Lil Mo. They're 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 if not friends at the moment, but they're still they're still in, in the same business together. They work together. Mm-hmm. They're still on set together. She doesn't need me to do any of that. But when you have big grown producers walking up in her face and trying to be disrespectful to get that rise, mm-hmm. it was safe for her to call me. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And and I think she should have because in that moment we only seen that maybe five six minutes of it mm-hmm. but we had been there for three hours okay mm-hmm. oh, okay we had been there for three hours and that was the third time i was called inside and so in a reunion uh shante mentions slightly that this was a tactic that you did um it was alluded that that was something that you kelly did a lot of times when you were um kind of being i guess a diva per se on set you know you were always calling out jeffrey jeffrey and so the women obviously took it a, a different perspective but i don't if this was the case how come there couldn't have been a conversation where you could have called or tweeted and said you know Lil mo this is why i blah blah and so that there's not any discourse any, any yeah. discourse i actually would have wanted to have that happen mm-hmm. i can give you the timeline on it um mo is telling everybody i stopped talking to her but it literally only had been three days mm-hmm. um the altercation between Dawn and Mo happened on a Saturday night. Um, it was late. Everybody was calling my phone, and I was trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Jeffrey had actually spoken with Philip Bryant, Mo's husband, mm-hmm. and he told me there was a big blow up between Dawn and whatever. Everybody's blowing up my phone. If I'm not traveling on the weekend, and this is just the real of it, mm-hmm. I've said it before, I'm the minister of music at my church. Are you? I am. I am, and I'm responsible for helping run the services on Sunday morning. So if my phone is ringing and my and Little Mo called me at one o'clock in the morning to talk about that, I got to be at church at 7:30. Mm-hmm. I wasn't taking that call at one o'clock in the morning, and I said that to her. I said, Mo, you know what I have to do on Sunday. You wanted to call me to tell me why you and Dawn were fighting, and that I can't be in that headspace when I got to be up and at church at 7.30 in the morning. She knows that. Mm-hmm. I said that to her, but nobody's going to say that. She did come <clears throat> to my church the next Sunday. The very next day, she showed up at my church. I was not going to have that conversation at church. Mm-hmm. It was inappropriate. So I, I heard the she stopped talking to me. It was literally three days. Saturday night is when it happened. I didn't take the call at 1 Mm a.m. Sunday she showed up at my church. I would not have the conversation at church about the fight that she had with Don the night. It was inappropriate. Mm -hmm. I stand on that, and I wouldn't do it any other way if I had to go back and do it again. It was not the time or the place. So so three days after is when then you guys had... We met at Bugatti on Tuesday. Okay. Monday was the day every week that we went and we all shot our testimonials. Mm-hmm. They had us coming in at staggered times. They used to have us all come in at the same time. Towards the end of filming, they started bringing us in staggered, so a lot of times we wouldn't even see each other. Mm-hmm. I didn't see Mona again until Tuesday, which I didn't even know I was going to see her because they told me I was walking into a meeting with Dawn. Mm-hmm. Now, so. my question is... Glad to have you both here because I, th- I think one of the biggest things and I think that played into a lot of your um, combativeness with the ladies in regards to the monologues and regards to just what was going on yeah. was your schedule yes. and all the stuff that you have to do yes. and all the I didn't even know about the church part to add in there too yes. uh, but they did. the open mic the church stuff mm-hmm. And then being into a position where that took you away from, that was a a big excuse for why you didn't do the monologues with the women. And then you were still able to do a monologue yourself with Dawn. How can you explain that whole ins and outs of how you guys figure out what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, or how did that really play out into this particular situation? Let me just say, I don't know if you guys remember that there was a scene where I went through Kelly's schedule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They cut out part of it. The church was in there, all the things were in it. And in that, I talked about how your band is already in rehearsal, how Mm -hmm. Tori has already spoke with the people. Thank you. How this one has already been doing this. So it was a a whole full thing that we go now. I have a staff of people that we work with. Mm -hmm. Kelly wouldn't present a thing. We've been doing this a very long time together. Mm -hmm. There's no way that I would present something, bring it to the table, and then don't have time to do it. Okay, so my question is this, because... When you were at rehearsal, you yes. stopped, you, you got on the stairs, and you called Tori to mm-hmm. ask if he can direct it. That shot seemed very random. It didn't even match They asked outfit. me to do it. 
He was already in place. So he was already in place. He was already in place. And there, we went episodes, uh, literally days into, we went for weeks of shooting, mm -hmm. and they kept telling me, it's not time for you to introduce Tori on camera yet. It's not time for you to introduce Tori on camera yet. Wow. I did what I was told to do. But, the ladies know about him. I'm sorry. You know, this is not mm -hmm. even about pointing fingers. I am, because for me, it doesn't help to get into it as far as the ladies are concerned. Whatever's happening with us is not going to play out for me on Twitter, on Facebook, um, on, on the cameras. I feel like we owe each other the respect of having a private conversation and figuring out how we contributed to the, the diminishing of our relationship with each other. What I am telling you is that what we were doing, whether they admit it or not, was following instruction. Mm -hmm. So pretty much it was a meeting or, that you had with the other producers because Tori was al already there. Yes. Because <clears throat> when Little Mo and Shantae was like, oh, I have this other producer, his name is Fred. Mm -hmm. How did you take that and, you know, against Tori already being the producer set for the monologue? I was told that Fred was being brought in for contention and that he was being brought in to have a bit of a rub mm. because literally, again, after the meeting where they threatened to shut everything down, I stood firm on, I will not fight with these ladies on camera. Let's figure out what kind of drama I'm willing to give you, but I'm not going to be breaking bottles. I'm not going to be throwing hands with the ladies. So what they did was they created an implied fight. And so is that why you turned up with Tori? I mean, not Tori, with uh, Fred? I did what I, I did what I was asked to do. Okay. And yeah. it and it bit me in the behind mm -hmm. because what they did was they took it and they rolled it out there and they put it together in a way that they needed to to make me appear as if I'm just this volatile individual. But I have to accept responsibility for that. I agreed to do it mm -hmm. because I felt okay with, I was told he would only be there for a couple of episodes, that it would be that we would have, you know, this horrible energy with each other and then they would phase him out and we would get back to the business of making the monologues which you know when speaking of the monologues I have to say this this is something that I've been working on for a couple of years mm -hmm. and so when they wanted a season project and again I have to go to the producers didn't tell Faith in season one of R&B Divas Atlanta you do a record and that's gonna be the season project. She was already working on that project mm -hmm. and she brought it to the table and it became the season project for the show. Mm -hmm. When I met with the producers, they wanted to know any ideas that I had to bring to the table. I didn't want to do the, t the tour thing because they were talking about that in Atlanta and it didn't seem to be going too well. I did talk to them about putting together a recorded project and they said, we don't want to do that because Atlanta did that. So we shot around a bunch of ideas. I talked about doing a play, but I said, if we do a play, there's not going to be enough time to rehearse a play while we're shooting the show. So monologues came up and I'd been working on a monologue show. I said, perfect, I'll bring my show to the table. Playwright J.D. Lawrence, comedian and playwright J.D. Lawrence and I, literally were going to put a monologue show up on Off-Broadway two years ago called Tired the Musical. And the scenarios were going to be taken from my song Tired. Tired, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes. then, so... Mm -hmm. um, in other um, interviews that we've had with some of the other divas, you know, they said that prior to the taping, they were either they either spoke through Skype or some form of, of uh, social media, uh, some form of communication, or there was an in-person interview where you basically, like in reality shows, what they do is they talk to you, they figure out all what you're going to do, yes. and they figure out what's going on in, your on, on in your life to figure out what's your story that they can use, and then they take that to create your storyline. So it seems to me, and I just want you to clear this up, that in your in your story that you were telling them this is what's going on with me blah 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 mm -hmm. I had this idea for the monologue so therefore did they take that and then after after they had the meeting with you then they informed the girls we're gonna you're gonna have your storyline but the but the main event of R&B Divas LA will be the monologue and they just didn't tell everyone else that it was your idea um. I'm, a, I'm imagining that that's what happened. And you know, there are two different things that happened at the reunion. Mm -hmm. um, Shantae said the monologue wasn't my idea, that it came up during the season when we were taping at the Savoy. And I, re I rebuttaled and I said, that's not true. I'd been in communication with production before everybody was even locked in for this show. Mm -hmm. And that we understood that that's what it was going to be. She said that was untrue. Mo came behind her and said that before she ever signed her contract, they told her that the season project was going to be a monologue mm -hmm. and that she didn't want to do a monologue. She wanted to tour. Mm -hmm. Those two statements don't match up. Yeah. 
because if you're saying that it came up and it came up with me and you for the first time at the Savoy when we were already filming, mm -hmm. how did Mo hear about it before she signed her contract? Which is, That's because the yeah, idea was yeah. already in play Please. and I'd had that discussion. Yeah. Okay, yes. so I have a question just to clear this up. So it was your idea. Yes. And you already had it in place. You'd already talked to Tori. Yes. You already had a band. Yeah, so my, my band, my players are all local, and that worked because everything was about we don't have enough money to this, that, and the other, and my band was willing to do it whether it was little money or no money because it was me. Okay, mm -hmm. so then if that's the case, how did you have time? I mean, in the show, it, it looked as though mm -hmm. you did not have time to do the monologue with the ladies because Fred was there and it wasn't going your way. But then you ended up having your own monologue. Yes. So was that already in place by the time Fred got into the storyline? Did you already have that going on? Or did that come about because Fred, because you didn't want to do the stuff with Fred? Fred was actually more involved in the storyline than I knew by the time I realized it. Because the day that I showed up there and Don and I walked in and it appeared as if we were walking in hours late. Mm -hmm. First, let me say that we weren't late. My call time was set for two hours later than everybody else's. So when I walked in, I walked in because that was the time mm -hmm. I was told to arrive. Mm -hmm. right. um, but I wasn't aware that there had been several rehearsals with Fred until that day. I'd been, you know, management had been told, and I actually walked out. You didn't see me walk out at another point. I went to Jeffrey and I said, this don't feel like what we talked about. Something feels weird. This is, this seems like something else is going on. The vibe is crazy in here. And this does not feel like what we said was going to happen. He actually made a call to the production offices and spoke with the people behind the desks, not the ones who were there on site, mm -hmm. and said, listen, I need you to tell me what's going on. You all said, blah, 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 blah. It's looking like whatever. And he wasn't on the set because manage all managers were banned <clears throat> from the set. None of them were ever allowed to be on the set, which is why I would have had to scream to have him come. Because the truth of the matter is, is they didn't want extra eyes on the set because you'd be able to see all the little sidebar conversations and the shadiness happening from, you know, behind the cameras. But, um, they asked him, Can, you know, we discussed this, Jeffrey, we discussed this in the manager's meeting because there was a separate manager's meeting after the meeting with everybody so that they could go through things with the manager and saying, we know the ladies are opposed to, you know, the drama, but just get your ladies to just kind of go along with it. We'll keep it respectable. He was asked again on the call that day when he called and said, Kelly's saying this doesn't feel right. We discussed this. Just tell her it's what we said. <clears throat> go along with it. She's going to give Fred a problem. We're going to let this run. We filmed two or three different days all on that same day I had three changes of clothes with me um, and they said please just do like we asked we're gonna get this all out of the way today and we will phase Fred out so you all can get back to the business of making the monologue show for real okay well thank you mr. Jeffrey um, mm -hmm. we're done with you so okay. thank you for uh, sitting <laughs> in with you. us for a couple minutes thank you, babe. Yeah. Kelly, let's talk about let's talk about Vegas because yes. there was a lot of there was a lot of indiscrepancies. You know, Tori called in, we got his side of the story. We've heard some other things from mm -hmm. some of the other R&B divas. Yes. And okay, Tori said that he was asked to push the date back, yes. knowing that you would not be there because you had to fly out to L.A. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, did TV One do that just so that there's drama and conflict, so that you're not there? Uh, I, looking at the way it rolled out, I would say yes, mm -hmm. because in my mind, the biggest problem for me was that I wouldn't be there because I'm always there with the kids. Mm -hmm. um, but when I discussed it with Tori, I said to him, when I went to them and asked to include Broadway in the Hood inside of the season, mm -hmm. my intention was for Broadway in the Hood to get as much as exposure as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. We want people to know the work that you're doing with these kids, and we want them to donate. And the only way for them to see what you're doing is to see what you're doing. So if they're telling you that they're not going to film it unless you move the date, then move the date. Mm -hmm. I'm not important. That was our conversation. So me not being there, I never thought was going to be brought into the storyline as me being a no-show. Mm -hmm. When I heard it, I said, do whatever they ask you to do. We want the cameras there. We want people to see what you're doing. I, you know, I just, that was, I got, that was a side swipe. And so, then, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, right. And then also, Tori was told yes. after he spoke with us on After Buzz TV. Mm -hmm. He was told that if he talks or speaks publicly about um, anything in regards to R&B Divas, yes. that they would sue him. He got a letter the very next day. Okay. After after his interview with you, he received a letter from legal, 
Mm -hmm. And he was told that he was not to disclose things that could be considered trade secrets mm -hmm. because it was never supposed to be known that I did not just not show up. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to look like I just didn't show up and that I left the lady stuck and really didn't have the high regard for those kids and for that organization that I do have. So uh, Is that the same thing with you? Because I don't want you to get in trouble. <laughs> well, the show is over at this point, and I would say that we all probably should be really careful because they edited a conversation and made it appear as though I brought a weapon into to hurt someone and we all know that that's not true they know it's not true and it's not stopping anybody from saying it that's a little illegal because yeah. also when you you're you were been down getting items out of the bag yes when you when you mentioned the the vaseline the the tams and the and the straight edge yes. shantae in the reunion said that she actually didn't see the the the, the straight what is it? Straight, straight, straight edge. Straight edge. Yeah. She, said, she said she didn't actually see it. And so, one. and then I did hear somewhere else that they, it was a voiceover. Two separate conversations yeah. that were sniped together, which is the reason why you couldn't see my face. You could kind of see my face when I said Tim's because I kind of did this and Vaseline um, and you heard straight edge, but I was this way yeah. and then it kind of cuts. Where did, the, where did the straight edge, where, where, where did that conversation come from? When I was talking about the list of props that I would have for my actual monologue, but there were several things, you know. So then my other question to you um, is, why did you bring props to the rehearsal? Because normally, you know, you know, when you have rehearsal, you yes. tell your musicians, okay, bring your shoot music, or, mm -hmm. or, or bring shoes, or, you know, like. Yes, why, why did I bring them? Yeah. Um, because we were under the impression based on our conversations off camera, mm -hmm. that after we phased out the Fred thing, mm -hmm. that we were gonna actually get into the work of putting together our monologue show. So I started bringing props with me. The other ladies didn't have props because what we also talked about off camera is that we kept having these conversations where they're saying, we don't have money for this and we don't have money for that and we don't have money for the other. And they insisted, we, don't, we shouldn't be spending our own money to do their show. So I'm not spending right. money on my own props, and I didn't disagree with them. I told them, you're right. You shouldn't have to spend your own money on props. The things that I brought with me, I brought out of my house. Mm -hmm. Vaseline came from my house. My Tim's came from my house. All of that, the, the doll baby came with, you know, that's the stuff you didn't see. There was mm -hmm. a doll baby, and there were little girl clothes, and I had a notebook, and I had other stuff in there. I had a lot mm -hmm. of stuff because my monologue would have walked me through several stages of life. So you said that you were the infamous, I'm busy, I'm booked. Yes. <laughs> that people are now using that as hashtags and things on yes. social media. You're so, welcome, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you, if you were too busy and you were too booked, as, as, you, um, as you said in the mm -hmm. show, then how can you have been too busy to do your own monologue with Don? Because I wasn't, because I was always planning to do the monologue with the ladies and mm -hmm. because my band was in rehearsal mm -hmm. and because Tori was already planning the show and because all of those things were already happening. The I'm too busy thing came in because they were telling me you're too busy to do it and I'm telling them, no, I'm not too busy. Mm -hmm. When I sat in the restaurant with Shantae and Little Mo, of course you only saw a piece of that as well, but that was you know, a pretty extensive conversation as well, even though you only saw a couple of minutes of it. Mm -hmm. um, they felt that I was too busy. And at a point in the conversation, I said to them, you all feel that I'm too busy to do this and put this together right because of my schedule. This keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. I personally know that I can pull this off. You're the ones who aren't comfortable mm -hmm. with whether or not I can do this right based on the way my schedule is because again with a team of people with a musical director with a production manager and a stage manager and a director and all of those people already working I don't need to be there if I have to fly out to do a show and come back what I need to do is be there when it's time for rehearsal for all of the ladies I don't mm -hmm. need to be there for what's happening in the putting together of the production that's what they're for and they were there mm -hmm. you know and again I'll, I'll say this you know Tori Tori, uh, his mother was sick. She had cancer, um, and she died during the filming of the show. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. um, she actually passed on my birthday, um, and he didn't tell me. He was at my party that night um, where all the ladies were. He didn't tell me until <clears throat> the next day because he didn't want me to know. Um, I told the ladies that in the restaurant that day as well. I told them that his mother had passed, um, and we had a moment that, of course, nobody saw. Little Mo cried. Everybody was really upset about the fact that his mother died. Um, and when we finished filming that segment, Little Mo and Shantae picked up the phone. They called Tori to wish him their condolences. 
they rolled cameras, production rolled cameras on them calling Tory to wish their condolences um, and ask him how he was feeling. They asked him if he felt like he would be able to continue with the monologues because of the death of his mother. Mm. All of this they filmed. Um, he had no idea that they were filming the phone call. He got a call after he hung up with Shantae and Mo from someone in production to ask him if it was okay to use the call. And he sent a letter back because, you know, he it literally sunk in. They were filming that call. Mm -hmm. And he had kind of mixed feelings about that, too, because when somebody calls you to say, I'm so sorry to hear that your mother died yesterday, right. the last thing you're thinking is, they're filming me for a television show while this is happening. Mm -hmm. Imagine what he felt like. And he literally said, I want to believe that that call was genuine. Mm -hmm. I'll choose to believe that that call was genuine, but somebody should have told me that the cameras were rolling. He sent a letter to TV One, to Think Factory Media, um, as well as to uh, one of the producers from 10 to 1 mm -hmm. Entertainment, and said to them that, you know, Shantae and Mo called me to wish me condolences. That call was being filmed, and I was not told prior to the fact that the call was being filmed. Then someone called me and asked if it was okay to use it. I'm not giving permission to use this call because this is about my family. That's a private moment. You know, he went on to say all of that, and I'm hoping that you'll understand and, and respect my wishes mm -hmm. and not utilize this footage. And he ended the letter with saying, I look forward to seeing everybody and finishing the monologues in a couple of weeks. That's not something that somebody says if everybody doesn't know that Tory's in place. Mm -hmm. And if everybody didn't know that Tory was in place, why call him and ask him if you, if you are going to be able to finish this with us mm -hmm. because your mother died? But that happened, and that letter exists as well. And so did Tory... On the, on the monologues that you did with Don, did Tori direct that? Or? Yes, he did. Okay, he directed it. And then go ahead. So, um, so my question is, I mean, it's obvious that the production, The Wizard or whatever, has taken a big hand on the project and has put in a lot of people into positions of not accurately depicting themselves yes. or setting them up to slightly be natural, but more so be manipulated in how the viewing audience sees you. Mm -hmm. For me, with everything that's happened, with the course that your friendship has gone through when it comes to, I know you guys made a nice penny off of doing a, a show, so was it worth it? Was it worth Not as nice as putting the the your image had. up for <laughs> for shots? Because, I mean, I, I mean, I, I would say for new fans, I, I've always known about your music and I've always been a, a, a admirer, but I wasn't necessarily a big, big Kelly Price fan right. until I started watching the show. Right. And then the first couple of episodes, I was like falling in love. I was like, oh, she's such a wonderful person. She's nothing like the uh, Kiki from Lazarus and what yeah. they're doing and all that. And then it flipped. <laughs> and then I'm like, if I barely knew you, they set me up to like you for like two seconds and right. then all of a sudden go into this horrible like journey with you and I mean it's good to be on shows like this to kind of allow people to see mm -hmm. what's behind the curtain so that they don't pass judgment as quickly or throw stones but right. it's more so still like you had to you even said it when you said people chose to be in positions in order to get the show moving and if you decided to take that sacrificial position like what what did you learn from doing a show like this well I, I agreed to take the <laughs> sacrificial position with Fred and again I have to own that responsibility um, but even in my mind I never saw it going like that because if it had happened the way it was discussed mm -hmm. behind closed doors we would have had that moment it would have resolved with Fred Fred would have been told this is not going to work out and we would have continued doing what we had been doing mm -hmm. getting ready for the show with the team that was already in place. And that didn't happen. Um, I did make a huge sacrifice. I made more of one than I actually thought I would have been making. Um, but with that, I have to take the position that the only thing I have to go on now is 21 years of being Kelly. Mm -hmm. And I don't deny that the side that people saw of me exist. Mm -hmm. And for anybody that can be as harsh as they can be to act as if they don't have a side to them like that, I can't even listen to that because that's just, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Everybody can be pushed to the point of going off. Um, but I have to defend that I never went there with any of the ladies because I respect them too much. Um, and I keep saying that I'm yelled at, I've never yelled at them. I've never cursed at any of them. I've never called any of them out of their name. I feel like even in the height of a disagreement, <clears throat> we owe it to each other to work it out, even if it is heated. You know, um, I've never gone there. 
not with them. Um, and honestly, being an artist, I've never really had to go there with people, even as far as in the position of producers. I've never been put in a position where my manager is banned from where I am. Mm. He's generally, or somebody with my team, is generally there so that if something goes wrong, they can step in and be the buffer between me and whomever I'm working with. There was no buffer. So when it came time to fight or to defend myself because crazy stuff was happening, there was no Jeffrey. Mm. So we're running out of time, and I have I have a, about five, six questions I have to really get okay. in. Let's talk about the tour. Yes. So it was announced on Monday that on Monday that you guys are doing this tour. It's with uh, you, Kelly Price, Faith Evans, Shantae Moore, Don Robinson, and uh, Brownstone. Nikki Stone and Brownstone. Brownstone and and Kiki White and Kiki White. Yes. Okay. I just have to ask and just go there. Yes. Um, who made the choices f for some of the women? People are a little like, hmm. Why did y'all tell everybody? Yeah, wh why did why didn't we not take everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, I mean, obviously on the on the reunion show, it was mm -hmm. a surprise to these women. So why weren't they? Everyone women? wasn't surprised. <laughs> well, some of them. Mm -hmm. Why weren't the women? <laughs> told and who chose the women to be on the tour? The promoter. I, okay. I said it on the show and I've been saying it. It was the promoter's choice. He is the one that is putting up the money. He's paying everybody. <laughs> He's paying to travel everybody. He's paying the musicians. He's paying for everything to get the venue. He made the decision on what the ticket would be. Mm -hmm. And he really wanted to bring everyone out. Um, but whether or not everybody admits it, there are some people who are not willing to go out on the road with other artists okay but i got one thing to that uh on cnicky.com mm -hmm. basically shantae made a statement came forward said the tour hasn't signed a contract or anything yeah in the last 18 hours she just kind of posted that yeah that there's no tour yeah and I she says that. she says it was premature announcement that was made by kelly i didn't know that she was going to make the announcement on the show but i thought i should let it go at the time because of a union was taped a couple weeks ago and so what is, do i say to that to yeah she did know about the tour mm-hmm um, she did not know that I was going to make the announcement because I'd actually just gotten the call from the promoter's office and he wanted to be able to get the buzz out there. Um, so I got the call mm -hmm. um, before we taped the reunion and they asked, can you make the announcement? I asked permission from the production staff. Can I make an announcement? Mm -hmm. And they said yes. She did know about the tour. Um, she did agree to go along on the tour. I can't discuss where her contract process is. Mm -hmm. um, that would be between her management and everyone, but I was assured from the promoter's office that when they asked me that it was okay to say who was going on the tour. Okay, because mm -hmm. that was my question is, yes. did you or Faith, being that you guys probably are the two headliners, mm -hmm. did you have any say so and, and who should or not? Because, again, like I said, there's some people that kind of wonder, you know, Don is only, she's within Vogue, so... I'm not trying to throw shade as, you know. Well, I, 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 when it comes to Dawn, I will say this. I disagree that being a member of En Vogue and Lucy Pearl, she has the right to perform song, every song, song that she's ever done with either of those groups, which gives her a live. long list okay. of hits. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the show is going to have a live band. We're all sharing a common band okay. and background singers. So everyone will have a live band and background singers. So she will be in full form with, okay. on the stage. Um, as far as if whether or not we had a say in it, I was asked mm -hmm. if there would be any issue because the promoter is looking at stuff in the media. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be an issue between you and Shantae Moore? And I said, absolutely not, because we're both grown women. And the truth of the matter is, is that the beef that he's seeing mm -hmm. ain't real. Yeah. I don't have an issue with Shantae right. Moore because she yeah. and I actually never got into it. And I won't say anything other than that. I tell everybody, do what you got to do. Okay, I have to, mm. speaking of beef, I have to go to this Mariah Carey thing. You know, yes. with the whole tweet, with the whole tweet that you mentioned, you said that um, the tweet you mentioned was that. Between her and the TV. Was, uh, <laughs> I'm years late on this one, but I'm looking at a concert on TV right now and a certain singer in parentheses yes. and asking myself, what happened to your voice? Sometimes <laughs> the gimmick goes too far. One day you go to sing and realize it ain't mm -hmm. happening. This is making my throat hurt. Yes. And people assume that it was Mariah Carey because. They because Mariah had um, a, a live concert that was rerun on TV, and you used to sing backup for Mariah Carey. Yes. Um, if you look at the I'll Be There video on mm -hmm. Maria's, um, Mariah Carey's Unplugged, that's you with the black turtleneck and asymmetrical and hairdo. Asymmetrical. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's yeah. you. So, you said on Wendy Williams that that conversation was between, your tweet was between you and the certain TV. But I do have to ask this. Yes. Between social, but between all social media, between the people who subscribe to you on YouTube, your yes. Twitter followers, your Instagram, yes. to say that that's between me and the TV. You're right. 
It's I'm not, not going to argue with you. Okay. You're right. So, so okay. You're right. So, you know, okay. Was it Mariah? Yes. No. Oh, was it J-Lo? And, 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 J-Lo? No, no, but I won't say who it was. <laughs> I am, I am, and anybody that knows me, I am an late night, all night rider. And I watch TV in the middle of the night. I catch up on everything in the middle of the night. My DVR is on full force in the middle of the night. And I watch a lot of concerts Mm -hmm. and a lot of music related stuff because that's what I do and that's what I love. Um, What really set it off, and it shocked me because I I remember exactly when it happened. Mm -hmm. That was late night on a Saturday night. And I did what I said, whatever it was that I said. I got up the next morning. I went to church. I didn't look at my the thing until I was riding home from church in the car. And I looked at my phone and I said, what the? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I saw all of this stuff. So when I went back on my timeline, I saw that someone had taken my tweet, mm-hmm. retweeted it, and put Mariah's name in it. Okay. Then I started seeing all of this other stuff about she had this concert on the night before. She did that and the other. She blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is absolutely insane. I found myself in the middle of a whirlwind. World, yeah, because they but really did try to let you have it. They, no, they did let me have it. <laughs> they did let me have it. And I thought, again, to myself, hey, you, you need to learn how to keep your thoughts to yourself. There is no, you know, I mean, so there are still lessons at this stage of the game to be learned. But at the end of the day, I tell this, that when... I finished high school and Mm -hmm. my friends went to college. I went to the school of life and a part of that school of life with me was Mariah. I was on the road with her by the time I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I got a passport to take my first overseas gig with her and I learned a lot of what's good and what's bad about this business Mm -hmm. from being out there with her and and really, really grew from just being a church girl that can sing to somebody who crafted herself in this business. Mm -hmm. So three questions. So number one, there's no beef between you and Mariah? No. Okay, so then let's also uh, let everyone know about the Too Fat for Fame. Too Fat for Fame. Yes. A new reality show that I am casting for. Um, So proud of it. Uh, It's my brainchild. Everybody knows my story. I am not the skinny chick. I've never been. But because there was so much uh, in the air about being a big girl trying to do mainstream music and not just being a gospel singer or a house singer, there are so many others out there like me. They sing, they dance, they act, they model, they do all of these different things, and they're literally not even considered because they don't fit what the standard of beauty is considered in this business. Mm -hmm. So, And we are told that we're too fat for fame, which is why I think I saw you say, I don't like that title. I know. But I did. What did they win? Yes. Yes, Well, what they're going to win, depending on who wins, whether it's a singer or an actor, we're going to connect them with an agent. We're going to follow them with their own show um, on their journey to becoming who they're going to be, whether it is a model or whether it is a singer or whomever wins the show. They are going to live together. You know, I just figure that it doesn't make any sense for me to water down the phrase because I've been told you're too fat. They haven't told me, oh, you're pleasantly plump. You're, You're a little thick. They've told me I'm too fat. They've said it to my face. They've said it within earshot. They've said it when they thought I couldn't hear. And so I know if I hear it even now that people are still hearing it. You know, I, it happened to me while filming this show. Okay. Some of the producers thought it would be funny to put me in a dress that was too small um, and just make a joke out of it. Right. And, you know, so it still happens. So we're going to shine light on this problem and get somebody famous and rich you as a result. Too. Well, I'll watch that yes. now. So, I'll watch it. So uh, one, one yeah. last thing. Um, when I first met you, Larissa and I met you at the Whitney Houston uh, yes. party. And when I interviewed you, I had something for you that I gave Praline. you. The Praline. And so <laughs> I told you that if you will come on after Buzz, yeah. that I would have, I would have your Praline. Come on, give the fat girl goodies. So, I love it. So my, uh, not, I'm telling you what. Not. So my sister from Didi Coco Pralines nice. made you the Pralines. So I have them for you, and we want to just. Thank you. I'll just we. You start, well, Megan, you can start wrapping we'll up. Get, and okay. Me, yes. Yeah. Um, That's so sweet. I'm Sorry, Megan everybody. Thomas. You can always find me Thank on at Megan, oh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Make sure you go to SerialBuddies.com and download Adventures of Serial Buddies because your download helps us right here at AfterBuzz TV. And I'm Alfred Thomas. You can see me at All Eyes on Black, and make sure to comment. Give us five stars on iTunes. We need that because that's what gives us Kelly Price, Little Mo, and so many more. <laughs> and I'm Larissa People. You can find me at True Peoples at True Peoples Media.com. I'm Bam Erickson. You can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Bam Erickson or you can find me at Big6Entertainment.com. Again, please enjoy the pralines. I only gave you a dozen because I knew you. I, I, no, I gave you half a dozen because oh you God. killed me if I gave you a dozen. So yes. I hope that's I hope that's enough I'm going to have you. to share these with Faith yes. though because mm-hmm. she says she wanted to. Hey. Okay. And where Perfect. do we find you on social media? Yeah. Uh, www.kellyprice.com Kelly Price for real on Twitter but please follow to, at Too Fat for Fame TV mm-hmm. and check out www.toofatforfame.com 
Facebook.com. Yes. <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning in to this Thank exclusive you. interview here on Afterbus TV for Miss Kelly Price, the RB Diva. Thank you guys, and we will see you um, if there's a season two. Ah. All right, so <laughs> we'll see you guys. Thank you for watching. From Bing.com, executive producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz later, yeah. <laughs> Expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.